Hello and welcome to History and Film. I'm Rich Simmons. Today we'll be discussing a man named Temujin. You may be thinking, I've never heard of Temujin, but I guarantee you have. You just know him by his title, Genghis Khan. Khans were the tribal leaders of the nomadic Mongol people. We actually don't know exactly what the term Genghis originally meant, but it was the title assumed by Temujin when he united the Mongols and became the Khan of all. So we can probably guess that it carries a lot of weight. I always bring up Game of Thrones. Well, it seems to me pretty obvious that the Dothraki are based on the Mongols. The Dothraki are fearsome warriors on horseback, nomads with calls, not cons, as their leaders. Though it's definitely not a one-for-one. One. The Mongols, for example, had to dress for colder weather. Mongolia, like the Midwest in the United States, has four distinct seasons and gets extremes of both heat and cold. It's geographically diverse as well, with mountains in the west and north, desert in the south, and grasslands in the center and east. It was home to various nomadic tribes over the centuries who often warred with each other. China even built a famous wall to help protect from these nomads north of them. And this was the world into which Temujin was born. The movie Mongol opens in 1192 with Temujin being held captive by the Tangut Kingdom, basically an independent region of China. I actually couldn't find anything that said they ever actually held Temujin prisoner, and the film seems to just use it as both a plot device and a reason to justify Temujin's hatred of them. From there, it quickly jumps back to Temujin narrating his life story, starting back when he was nine years old and his father was taking him to find a bride. Temujin was from a powerful family. His great-grandfather had actually been the first chief to try and unite the Mongols. Here, Temujin's father is hoping to make peace with the Merkit people, as he had actually stolen Temujin's mother away from them. So he wants Temujin to choose a Merkit girl. On their way to the Merkits, the young Temujin decides he likes one of the girls from the lesser tribe they are staying with for the night. His father ultimately relents, but worries this can mean war with the Merkits. It is agreed that when they are 12, Temujin will return and marry the girl, whose name is Borte. On their way home, Temujin's father is poisoned to death when he accepts a drink from another rival tribe at a watering hole. He knew the risk, but both sides were following the customs of hospitality, and he chose to accept the risk rather than appear disrespectful. Now, I'll go ahead and cut in and say all this is a fairly accurate start. The likely differences here are that his father probably did choose Borte for his son, and that Temujin actually stayed with his bride's tribe with the intention that he was to be a ward of her father until they were old enough to marry. His father was poisoned on the way home, but Temujin wasn't with him, though he did soon leave Borte's family to be with his own after his father's death. In the movie then, other men in their tribe seek to fill the power vacuum left by the death of Temujin's father. They even debate killing Temujin, but he escapes and is briefly taken in by another boy, Jamuka. The two become blood brothers before Temujin is recaptured. The guys holding him decide he's too young to kill, and their plan is just to hold him captive until he grows tall enough that it won't be considered bad form to kill him. He escapes again, and we jump to the year 1186, when Temujin would have been about 24 years old. He's captured yet again and escapes yet again, this time finally going to track down Borte, who has waited for him all this time, and the two are married. The movie even gets her dowry correct, a sable coat. Sables are small mammals native to this part of the world. In our modern age of plenty in the U.S., we easily forget how valuable things like coats can be. Timmage's mother even says it's too much when Borte, her new daughter-in-law, hands it over to her. I'm going to cut in again. In reality, their tribe did basically abandon Temujin and his mother after the death of his father. He was later captured and enslaved by his father's former allies when he was around 15. The movie also leaves out all of Temujin's siblings, at least from any significant roles. He had two older half-brothers, one of whom Temujin killed, and another who later became one of his trusted generals. And Temujin was 16, not 24, when he went back and married Borte. By 1186, when the movie has them unite, the couple had already had two children and one on the way. But again, even though the movie messes with the timeline, the events themselves are mostly pretty close. The Merkits, who Temujin's father had hoped to make peace with, come to seek revenge. Again, Temujin's mother had originally been married to their leader before being captured away by Temujin's father. Their price is Borte. Temujin is hit with an arrow in the back, and while he's basically passed out, Borte prods his horse to safety while she accepts her fate and is captured. Temujin heals and is reunited with his childhood blood brother, Jamuka, who is now a leader in the region. 
He eventually convinces Jamuka and his tribe to help him rescue Borte. Months have passed by this point, but they fight the Merkits and infiltrate their camp and rescue her. Temujin finds her very pregnant, but he immediately embraces the unborn child as his own. And this is pretty much how it went down. The couple's oldest son faced uncertainty his entire life as to whether Temujin was his biological father. Jumuka wants Temujin to be his second in command, but the two just have differing worldviews, different ideas of right and wrong. Some of Jumuka's men defect to Temujin's leadership, and then Jumuka's brother is killed while trying to steal horses from Temujin's camp. The man who had captured Temujin multiple times in the past joins with Jumuka, and they force a battle against the outnumbered Temujin. Temujin's side loses, and he is captured. But he's beginning to make a name for himself. This is where the movie gets to Temujin in the cell at the beginning. Jamuka sells him into slavery, and a noble from the Tangut kingdom buys him simply to put him on display in a cage as a warning to others. And here the movie seems to be taking advantage of a gap in the historical record. We don't have many sources to go on during about a 10-year period here, so the movie decided to put him in prison. And we get a long process of Borte tracking him down and rescuing him. Temujin now says he will finally bring laws to the Mongols, and he goes over them while praying to the Mongol god Tengri. Don't kill women or children. Don't forget your debts. Fight your enemies to the end, and never betray your Khan. We make another jump to the year 1196. It's the final battle for the soul of the Mongols. Will it be Jamuka's way of the past, or Temujin's way of the future? I'm not sure why the film chose 1196 though, there was a decisive battle, but five years after this in 1201. Temujin's side wins of course. Jamuka's men turn him over to Temujin at the end of the battle, and he has them executed for violating his rule about betraying your Khan. This appears to have actually happened, but in 1206, so not only five years after the actual battle, but ten years after the movie claims. Though, I do understand them combining things. The closing text of the film says, In 1206, year of the Red Tiger, Temujin was made Khan of all the Mongols, Genghis Khan of the Great Steppe. This now is correct. Again, not sure why they moved the battles up in the timeline in the movie. Then, another three years later, in 1209, Genghis Khan is grabbed out of time by Bill and Ted and brought to 1980s California after they tempt him into their phone booth with a Twinkie. Okay, sorry, but I am going to continue mentioning Bill and Ted every time they show up in our timeline. Let's pretend that their excellent adventure actually happened and we'll see them from the points of view of the historical figures they borrow. It says they grabbed him from Outer Mongolia. Roughly speaking, this is modern Mongolia, and there's an area next to it called Inner Mongolia that is a northern region of China. So what exactly made Temujin, now Genghis Khan, so unique? Basically, and as always, simply speaking, Leaders like Jamuka would promote warriors from good families, and plunder would largely go to those at the top. Temujin promoted a meritocracy. If you fought well and worked hard, you could rise up in his society, no matter how low-born you were. He would recruit any group to follow him and fight for him, while Jamuka would consider certain groups beneath him and shun them. The movie arguably goes too far in making Temujin always virtuous. His reputation for ruthlessness in real life was well-earned. His forces seemed to violate the movie's rule of not killing women and children, and he was known to have wiped out entire populations who resisted him. But Genghis Khan is a great example of how history is so influenced by who writes it. In places like Iran, he's seen as a monster, a genocidal warlord, who we could say decimated their population, but remember that decimate means to kill one in ten, and it is then likely too kind a word as the Mongols may have killed many times that here. Meanwhile, in modern Mongolia, Genghis Khan is a national treasure and the founder of their country. He's basically the Mongolian George Washington. Genghis Khan would rule his new Mongol empire for more than 20 years before his death. It continued to grow under his successors, reaching its height around 50 years later. It remains the largest contiguous empire in history, stretching from the entire east coast of China to eastern Europe in the west. If you think about how massive the Soviet Union was on the map before it dissolved, the Mongol empire was even bigger. This movie was obviously just the rise of Genghis Khan and really didn't get into the Mongol conquests. It was originally intended to be the first part of a trilogy, but the next installment still haven't managed to get off the ground. Mongol was nominated for Best Foreign Film at the Academy Awards and has an 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. Elsewhere in the world around this time, King John, who we discussed last week, was ruling England as Genghis Khan came to power. His son Henry III would be king when Genghis Khan died. 
In Italy, famed mathematician Fibonacci helped bring the Arabic numerals we use today to Europe. St. Thomas Aquinas was born in Sicily just two years before the death of Genghis Khan. A few other notes as always. We saw Temujin praying to the god Tengri. This is the primary god of Tengrinism. It was a significant religion to Central Asia among the Turks, Hungarians, Mongols, and others. And Genghis Khan was one of its followers. It was sort of a shamanistic faith with a strong focus on veneration of the dead. And Temujin actually had a decent reputation for religious tolerance as a ruler. As we see characters drinking alcohol in this film, it occurred to me that I haven't yet talked about alcohol and how it's developed all across the world in our timeline so far. It appears humans have been intentionally fermenting foods to create alcohol since at least the Stone Age 12,000 years ago. I'm far from an expert on this, but basically it's a matter of controlling the process of allowing yeast or bacteria to consume carbohydrates, releasing acids, gas, or alcohols as a result. You can smell the similarity here, for example, when making bread with yeast and the rising dough has a faint alcohol smell to it. That's not a coincidence. Different parts of the world each developed their own methods. The Chinese had mead from fermenting rice, honey, and fruit. The Egyptians, with all their grain, had plenty of beer and wine. Native Americans fermented everything from maize to pineapple to produce alcohol. And next week, we'll finally make our way over to the Americas with the Maya civilization in 1963's Kings of the Sun. Now, in a change of pace, to play us out today is Mongolian throat singer Batsarig Vanshig. I'll leave a link or two in the show notes where you can find more of his stuff. But we hear some throat singing in the film Mongol, so I thought this would be a great way to bring some of that to you. See you soon.